Aditya, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of Project Bolo. I think it's going to be an interesting talk today. Aditya, when and where were you born and where did you study? I was born in 1972 February. I was born in Chandigarh. My father was an Air Force flight engineer. And uh, then I grew up in uh, wherever my father was posted to. So I lived a large part of my life in Agra, Gohati and Chabua. And I studied in Kendriya Vidyalayas mostly, passed out from KV number one uh, Air Force Station Agra, my, both my 10th and my 12th. After that, uh, I dropped for one year or rather like, you know, sort of faffed around for one year mm -hmm. and then went on to study uh, Bachelor of Commerce Honours from Calcutta University, Goenka College. And after that, uh, I went and studied law from uh, Badwan University and I passed out law in 1996 and uh, I started uh, practicing after that like you know I got enrolled and all so this was in Calcutta when did you realize about your sexuality even as I was growing up like you know I was maybe about 11 years old when uh, I first started exploring my sexuality with my classmates and like I was one year senior student in in school etc and by the time I passed out which was when I was about 17 years old uh, I had been having sex for like a good five six years and uh, all of it was male to male sexual encounters and at no point in time uh, did I feel I was doing anything wrong or unusual or did I have any uh, like you know feeling of like oh my god is something terrible with me and all of that it was something that came naturally to me and I did it and uh, was there any shame or guilt there was no shame involved at any point in time there may have been a sense of guilt at times which was about like you know uh, if I'm fine, if I'm found out, the thing would not like my my issue would not have been the fact that it was sexual, but because it would have been a transgression that would be looked upon as some kind of a wrong thing that you've done, which would attract punishment from the school, for example. Like you know, why do you run away at uh, the interval with the classmate to like wherever and then come back uh, when the first period is already on after after the recess. I mean, you know, see, there, there was this whole game of seduction that we were playing while we were in school. Like, you know, that whole peer sex thing works as a network. It is not like two people do it and then it is like happily married ever afterwards uh, and it is just these two. You were constantly looking for new partners. You, you were trying to recruit new people. Others who you have had sex with are trying to recruit new people and then they, they are joining this. So it was a network. It was a sexual network. And within that network, people did talk. Amazing. So, where did the sexual network operate? You see, uh, when you were growing up in what are essentially military bases, uh, these, are, these are little universes in, on their own. So, most of the time it's confined to like, you know, the, the school or like within the compound, etc. Like, you know, for, we nowadays have this whole debate about adolescent sexuality and like, you know, pedophilia and all of that. See, when I was 14, when I was 15, I was actually actively seeking out people who were young recruits into Air Force, who were 17, 18 years old, and I was having sex with them. It was consensual and you know, how do you define that? The law seems to be very obtuse about these issues. They don't want to address it, which is a problem. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like an ostrich syn syndrome, you know, like I bury my head in sand and the problem goes away. It does not. But to deny adolescent sexuality per se, lock, stock and barrel and say like this is something which doesn't happen to me and, and justify that in terms of like, like frivolous arguments of culture, frivolous arguments of religious ethos, frivolous arguments of like, you know, our national values. That's absolutely nonsense. After college, you moved to Kolkata? Like I passed out my 12th in 1989. I moved to Calcutta and joined the college in 1990. That one year gap was one of those, like, you know, when you like move around and do stuff and see things. And I went on a Bharat Darshan tour. So all of that thing happened. Uh, so that was 1990 when I moved to Calcutta. And uh, that's when, like, you know, you, 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 people started, like, you know, boxing me. Like, you know, people I would meet up would say, like, because you this, therefore you are, because you're doing this, therefore you are, this kind of a person or th this is what you are. Who are these people who started labeling you? That is something I want to know. People I was having sex with. Like, you know, I would go to a cruising area. I mean, you discover cruising areas. You go to a cruising area, you find somebody. But that person wants to label you. Like, you know, are you Koti? Are you Panti? Are you gay? Are you bi? Uh, what, like, you know, so those were terminologies which didn't mean anything to me. 
before that it was performance it was something i did because it came naturally to me i never felt bad about it i never questioned it but suddenly what used to be a natural act it was like breathing it was like eating food i mean you know it it, it didn't have a label but suddenly it had a label it it was being defined for me and the way i performed was also defining me aditya did you ever subscribe to any gender role playing i never had issues with my own femininity or whatever i i i i don't i don't think i was ever overtly feminine either and that is not a statement on like you know of derogation on femininity at all there were people who were feminine in our schools while i was growing up in my adolescent phase there were people who were feminine they were teased across the board by everybody including people who like you know were also having sex with other guys and that association between sexuality and femininity was something that we did not make because i knew so many people who were getting penetrated in the sexual act and were football players and were like you know the the, the epitome of studness they continue to be so the sports presenter on national television nowadays some is like you know gone on to become something other the model whatever they have done all these um, all these very ultra masculine kind of um, roles they have performed but sexually they have been penetrated so for me to reconcile the fact that like you know the whole notion of how you perform sexually is actually so closely linked to like you know how you will be defined or how you will self define yourself and it it was a, it took a very long time for me to like you know sort that out in my own mind and come to the conclusion as to why it is happening and when when it happened it was like a bulb glowing going off you know like you know that is it but the reverse was also true like you know this whole patriarchist heterosexist edifice that we created also meant that like you know people imbibed stereotypes of what is a man and what is a woman and those stereotypes include sexual roles if i am a man that is born with a penis and i get penetrated in the sexual act i don't remain a man anymore i get derogated from that status like you know that that perch which is, which is the privilege of the man in the pet patriarchist order i get somehow like sort of i fall from that grace and if i fall from that grace then what i am what am i i i must be something less than a man and what is the equivalent of a less than a man that i have in terms of like you know identification i'm like a woman i'm not a woman but i'm like a woman and we, that was what was problematic to me these people were also in, like you know the feminine person who's who's willing to get penetrated in the sexual act and liking it were also imbibing that stereotype and that was the more problematic area and how did you find your sexual network in kolkata this was like you know pre cell phone pre internet um age when we actually wrote postcards and inland letters so i mean for many people to even like you know believe that such a time existed nowadays like the younger generation who took take all of these things for granted is very difficult but there was a time which is like that so when i came to calcutta i had no clue about what is, what was happening but as is usual uh i kind of bumped into the network because of things like public loose where there was cruising happening and therefore like you know oh my god people doing things here and then you 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 come to know a few people then you come to know about more cruising areas then you go and make friends within those cruising areas so it was mostly cruising area based um, expansion of that network which developed over a period of time maybe 6 7 months after i went to calcutta so that's how it happened one of the positive outcomes of that uh, whole um, interaction was also that i came to realize that it was not just people meeting each other for sex but there were also all these other people who were concerned in other other ways so i got in like you know i came to know about council club now uh, there were these newsletter kind of things that council club was publishing at that point in time so i started acquiring those like you know from friends from friends of friends etc and that expanding network sort of brought me in contact with all of these people who were trying to um trying to make a positive and i came to know although not directly but through like correspondence and other things debanuj so people like that and um, of course i came to know and know about and i met him much later but i came to know about ashok and that he came out and all of that that was when like you know suddenly this whole other universe opened up that is there are problems like you know there were all these things which were dis- happening disconnectedly in my life 
which was bothering me to some extent like this whole thing about boxing people into identities this whole thing about femininity masculinity and how that is supposed to define you this whole thing about violence that i was actually t- l- coming across like that was like for me a discovery of sorts you know connecting the dots and figuring things out for myself it 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 didn't happen overnight it took some time and what did you decide to do about it i remember it was in my, in the last year of my graduation that was in 1993 i think was it last or last to last year? i don't remember the exact date it was it was few months before siddharth gautam died that he actually came to calcutta and under from invitation from council club if i'm not mistaken but um, he came to calcutta and he was giving a lecture so i went i i reached late and there was this door the, the room was very packed so i could not enter the door and i remember like you know i was standing outside of the door and kind of like half peeping in and there was this guy who was standing on the other end standing and talking and he said things like i'm a lawyer and i'm gay and these are the problem areas and he mentioned that was the first time i heard 377 being mentioned and and about hiv and about the thing fact that things needs to change and all of that and that was almost the time when i was thinking like you know okay i passed my 12th standard i had i wanted to have fun and like you know basically faff around for some time and not do work and study and all of that which i am doing and done but i also need to now sit think seriously about figuring out what i really need to do with my life and then i heard this guy say like you know lawyer and gay and all of that and i'm like okay i am gay and this is something which is interesting i mean you know it is not boring like medicine or engineering or chartered accountancy this is something where you can actually maybe do things and make thing make dip, make a difference and things like that and suddenly like it's like like you know oh my god maybe this is what i should do how did your parents react to this for a very long time my father never spoke about it or criticized me or anything but his entire thing was like he'd given i have given up on you and i don't know where you are headed or whatever but if you need help you can ask for it like you know you can come to me seeking help and i will be there for you that was his entire attitude my mother was worried at times my mother tried to like you know all of that but they had essentially they had given up on uh, trying to determine for me what my career path should be which is maybe a nice thing because that also meant that at a later stage when it came to like this whole pressure for marriage that everybody goes through my parents were kind of hands off about it and then i said like no it's not happening my mother was more hopeful than my father and she kept insisting for a while then that pressure also abated for a while so no there there was aditya when did you come out to your parents you see the thing is i have never come out to my parents now does that mean that i'm out or not out i don't think there can be anybody more out than i am my parents have seen me on television talking about sexuality and my own sexuality seen me with my partner on barkhadats we the people read articles that have written on papers and magazines and stuff uh, have seen all all my gay friends and other koti friends come into the house for get togethers parties whatever i've taken my parents to like film festivals showing gay films to um, like you know the first queer dance drama that uh, sapphire creation hosted in calcutta i've taken my parents there and they've seen it so in a way i have always exposed them to all of the things that i was doing how did your parents and friends react to you talking in the media when i have appeared in television interviews people have called up my mother and said like oh i saw aditya on tv you know on this whole thing about like you know gay people and stuff like that there was a point in time when i when i suppose my mother would have tried to be um, like you know she would have tried to sort of uh, be protective of this whole thing or justify it and like you know uh, give excuses for wh- my conduct or whatever and then she would confront me about like you know this has happened and beyond a point i told my mother mom if somebody calls you up and you don't know how to reply say i don't know how to reply i don't know why aditya did it this is aditya's number you talk to him directly there is no use tying yourself up in knots for what i am doing the only thing you need to know as far as my work, work is concerned is that i will not do anything unethical unjustified immoral according to the values that you have taught me 
Okay. What did you do after law school? Nineteen ninety six, I passed out uh, my law. Ninety uh, seven, I got enrolled as a lawyer. Ninety uh, uh, till ninety six, I was working part time with Prajok as their advocacy person. Uh, I continued to work with them for the whole of ninety seven as well. And uh, at the same time, I started working with one of Calcutta's biggest uh, solicitor firms, Meheria. Because I was working with this good big firm, I also had the good opportunity to work with some of the like you know big legal eagles of the Calcutta bar. It was a good uh, indoctrination into the whole legal process, which has stood me in good stead for all these years. Uh, I was working part time with Prajok, and I was working almost full time with Meheria. Ninety seven, the whole year, I I did that. The ninety seven end uh, after Diwali of ninety seven, I took a decision to move to Delhi, and I moved to Delhi. And where did you work in Delhi? Because of my work with Meheria and like you know that that kind of past, and of course my academic results, one of India's biggest. Solicitor firms in Delhi, like you know, started by Ashok Sen, the ex coal minister and all, now run by his son-in-law. Uh, they hired me as an associate lawyer, and I was with them for about two and two years. Uh, they paid well and all, so like you know, so that's how the career career graph kind of took on. But one of the things that was also happening is after I came to Delhi, these were the years, like you know, ninety eight, ninety nine. Were the years when I was also uh, getting in touch with all of these people who were coming to the Hamrahi meetings at Naz. So the Hamrahi support group was very much happening, and then gradually, because of because I was very active there and all of that, a large part of the responsibility of conducting, controlling, doing things for Hamrahi came on me. I started uh, because of my Naz Calcutta connections. They were the kind of sister organization, so Naz Delhi also like you know I was I was frequenting and I was working there. So it's very much into that thing. I mean, you know that 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 bit of it. I, I, that connection was connect was always there. After about two years, uh, by ninety, uh, it was uh, ninety eight, ninety nine end, beginning of two thousand, that I came across a advertisement in the newspaper, saying legal organization uh, for HIV related work looking for lawyers with experience. You can apply. I didn't know who they were, but I applied. They called me for an interview, and I found out that it was Lawyers Collective. So I was hired in, I think it was January of 1999 that I was hired, Lawyers Collective, and I was with Lawyers Collective for about two and a half years. 2001 endish, I left. What kind of cases were you handling at Lawyers Collective? Regular HIV litigation. I filed some of the first uh, HIV litigations. I was an advocate on record for some of the first HIV litigations in Delhi. My last year in Lawyers Collective, I was given the brief to draft a petition challenging the constitutionality of Section three seventy seven of IPC. Section three seventy seven is the section that criminalizes sodomy, and I spent a large part of my last six, seven, eight months with Lawyers Collective researching and drafting that petition, which was ultimately filed by Nas. And Lawyers Collective was the lawyers; Nas was the clients. It was filed by Nas in the Delhi High Court. And some eight nine years later, that is the petition that led to the judgment. And uh, how was your personal life in Delhi? The gay scene in Delhi was always like everything else in Delhi, extremely class conscious, ext- extremely like um, you know ostentatious. So uh, there were all these strata. There was the intellectual strata. They constituted an entire different universe. Then you had the what I would call the whole. uh kitsch pom showbiz uh, arty uh, farty kind of crowd see uh, i had um i think i could actually uh, negotiate kind of between these crowds because i had certain advantages i i i painted and sold my paintings even as i was going through my college so of course i had enough knowledge of the whole like you know i i could bullshit my way about art And pretend to be like you know talking intelligent, so I could make get access into that kind of crowd. I could speak English. I could be suave if I wanted to, so I could get access to that kind of crowd. But in actuality, I had nothing. You know, I was a poor person living in a barsati with like you know constantly worrying about how do I pay my next month's rent. It was not like I was rich or anything. 
So, where was your sexual network? Did you find it in Delhi? What happened? My sexual network has always been extremely, uh, well, I'm using the word Catholic in terms of the literal meaning of the word Catholic, which is like, you know, it was, it was kind of all inclusive. It, it, I, I, I never categorized myself, boxed myself into like, you know, this is exactly what I want. So I was having sex with transgender people uh, who were like, you know, totally, they said, oh, I'm a woman and you are my man. I said, okay, I'm your man for the day. And then there would be like these, like, you know, these entirely muscular, uh, gym-toned uh, demigods uh, who would uh, like, you know, sort of talk rough while they have sex. And uh, I was like, okay, that's your kick, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, fine. Were you involved with any organization at this time? Even as like, you know, the, the, the years that I was in Lawyers Collective and before and working with Hamrahi and all of that, I, we started organizing Hamrahi. Like, you know, we actually formed it into a trust. Salim was one of the trustees. Chappal was one of the trustees. But as usual, like, you know, Delhi crowd, it dispersed. Nobody was like really seriously interested in making it work, etc. And then came the 2000 Lucknow incident, right? When the Lucknow incidents happened, I was actually like, you know, very strangely, I had left Lawyers Collective. I wanted to discover, find myself. So I was doing a meditation camp at the Osho Ashram in Bridgwasan in Delhi. I was in, in the camp. They had said that uh, the requirement of the camp was that when you enter the place, you keep your mobile and your clothes and everything in a locker and they give you a saffron robe to wear and mala to wear and then you go into the camp and you stay there for seven days. So I had no clue that people got arrested or whatever. The only person who knew I was in the camp, because I say I had left Lawyers Collective, I was doing my own thing, was Lok Prakash. So when the shit hit the fan in Lucknow, uh, they started trying to, see, people were arrested uh, and the day they were arrested, um, all of those who were not arrested fled Lucknow. So they came, went to like various different places, some came to Delhi, some went somewhere, some went somewhere. So it was like, you know, they, they, they dispersed. So they, literally there was nobody in Lucknow. So that was on the first day. That was when, and Shiv was at that time in London. So Shiv called up uh, Lok Prakash and others and then Lok basically tried calling up various people in the Lawyers Collective, etc. I think L Lawyers Collective was also going through some kind of a transition at that point in time. So that did not immediately materialize. So then Lok basically took an auto and came to the ashram and said like, you know, there is an emergency that has happened and I have to meet Aditya Bandhavala. So that was like, you know, my 10 day meditation session ended on the 3rd or 4th day, I don't remember. So well, I did not become a sadhu completely. <laughs> I left. On the uh, the, like the night, the evening, by the evening, the arrests were there. The second day, I was like, you know, all of this thing was happening. I had taken the train and reached Lucknow by the third day morning. And uh, by that time, they had hired a local lawyer. I went and met with the local lawyer, and I was in court by about 10 30, 11 o'clock, moving bail on the third day of the arrest. I had to, uh, I, I realized that I had to do more of advocacy around mobilizing the civil society in India around Lucknow issue rather than actually assist in the legal process because after some time I did, did realize that the legal process will take its own course and the legal, legal relief is going to come only from the high court. It took about 10 days for the tide of, the, the, the tone of reporting in the media to change. From the media saying like, you know, gay brothel and sex club and all of that, like, you know, the, those sensationalist crap to like actually talking about, yes, we have an HIV policy. Yes, we need to like, you know, that took 10 days. The English medium media changed first before the Amarujalas of the world changed. That took 10 days. Gradually, all the women's groups, the more left wing student unions, etc. were brought in, in support. So all of that mobilization was happening, like, you know, which took up a lot of time. But at the same time, even as the mobilization, the civil society mobilization was happening, the pressure on the government and the police was increasing, like, you know. So there would be this uh, armed policeman 
policemen rather two of them who would follow me 24/7 around lucknow and it is actually psychologically very jarring when that happens you know like i would get out of the house in the morning i was staying at ari's house i would get out of the house in the morning take a rickshaw to go to the court and these two people with like these submachine like you know small stand guns in a motorcycle will follow the rickshaw at the pace of the rickshaw and the poor rickshaw walas would freak so after two days the rickshaw walas would refuse to take me as a passenger you know the court is like 5 kilometers off which essentially meant that i would have to walk 5 kilometers those kind of harassment early days of internet in india had to go to a internet cafe i was writing like 100 mails every day corresponding with people all across the world trying to like you know manage things like money like you know money how do you use this thing or get the offices open all of that whole that whole entire pressure there would be these policemen who would be outside doing this thing then they raided the internet cafe that i was working in luckily the day that happened i mean you know smoking is bad for your health yes but i had to buy cigarettes and i walked out and i had crossed the road and i was standing on the opposite side of the road and i suddenly saw like these 50 policemen with lathis and everything entering the internet cafe and raiding it so i cut out from there i mean you know i no, no turning back i just went you know those kind of harassment but okay luck the lucknow incidents was taken care of they got bail everybody it still took 45 days it is still took 45 days i mean you know in spite of our best efforts but i think and i'm not saying this because i want to take credit or whatever the way the atmosphere was the way the judiciary actually behaved where the judge could sit back and say i think it is a sin on society therefore i am not granting bail that was the order which was passed with that kind of attitude if that mobilization had not taken place it could have been 6 months it could have been a year and aditya since then what have you been working on i continue to work around more around issues of rights after that like you know i did the first study on uh, india and bangladesh on the kinds of rights violation that was happening that which was supported by the british foreign and commonwealth office under the aegis of naz that then led to uh, further work uh, with the defit pmo for example coming in and doing work most importantly i got involved with organizing the risks and responsibilities consultation that happened in uh, india but this was a consultation where 35 countries or 36 odd countries of the asia pacific region participated they participated separately as governments as community and as technical resources one of the things that came about is the need to actually overarchingly recognize all shades of opinions within the whole msm gay spectrum in india and work with them together what about the lawyer in you uh, the problem is many people understand law to be just litigation i mean you know unless you go wear a black gown and go to the court you're not being a lawyer that's not true i mean you know a large part of what i do is still law i mean you know when i'm discussing policy development when i'm when i'm talking legislation and positive legislation null changes when i'm advocating for things like uh, the nacp3 or whatever when i'm talking about uh, policy changes that will lead to like you know things like loop when i'm talking about the yogyakarta principle and how how things needs to be drafted and what is the kind of language that needs to put in what are the consequences of that all of that is law it is law so the lawyer in me is very much there it's just that the lawyer in me is doing things which are more interesting to me like having a relationship 2001 we met so then it 10 years wow 10 years is a long time how do you both make it work i don't know it works i mean we like each other that's it i suppose i mean not that we have not had our share of problems some of them pretty major problems i mean you know something some of the some of which we still dealing with but in spite of that yeah i think it's just that the fact that we liked each other enough to like you know continue to and in spite of the and also in spite of the fact that we are very different people in terms of person i mean you know we we have very little in common very very little in common but yeah i mean we we liked the company and we liked being together and we developed from there i mean you know we so it 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 worked 10 years is a long time 10 years is a long time yeah Aditya now that section 377 is read down what next the first thing we have to ensure is that we we see it through in in the supreme court 
once that happens all the rest of it follows this is just the first step the crucial first step but the first step everything else should we have rights of partnership like inheritance rights in some way what happens when people break up after having being in a long term relationship what happens to uh, my right to like adopt children do i should i have the right to adopt children or not can i take joint insurance can i take joint loans to buy joint properties should there be sexual harassment in the workplace so many issues thank you so much aditya i wish you all the very best thank you for sharing your life with project bolo